All right, looks like we're live. Hey everybody, we are here at the Sustainable Travel Summit and it is our final panel for the summit, but it is going to be so much fun. <laughs> uh, today's title is Too Good to Pass Up. And so we're gonna be talking about the final panel for the summit. Oh. Uh, some of us are watching YouTube while we're on the panel. Could you please final mute your YouTube? <laughs> because uh, we'll get some feedback. All right, thank you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, moving moving forward, we're gonna be talking with several experts today on how to find some of the best authentic food when we're traveling and to not miss out on any of those um, really tasty treats that are out there. <laughs> uh, so joining us today, we have Alyssa Schoenfeld from Bites of Boston Food Tours. Uh, we have Suchetta Rawal from Go Eat Give. Hi. We have Dylan Lowe from The Traveling Editor. And uh, if you missed his cooking demo earlier, you'll be able to watch it on our YouTube channel. And he made a beautiful brunch. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, if you missed that, please go back and watch it. It was really fun. I tried my best. <laughs> uh, and we also have Rosemary and Claire from Authentic Food Quest. And Authentic Food Quest is sponsoring today, and so they'll be here throughout the day. And if you have any questions for them, you can always reach out to them. All right. So I'd like everybody to have a chance to introduce themselves a little bit and talk about some of their expertise in, in food and, uh, and just giving us a little bit better of an idea of uh, your backgrounds. So Alyssa, why don't you go ahead and start? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. So um, my name is Alyssa Schoenfeld, and I um, am the owner and operator of Bites of Boston Food Tours in Boston, Massachusetts. So I started that in October of 2011. So just kind of in the first couple months of our sixth full season of tours uh, in the South End neighborhood of Boston. So my, my background really isn't in food. I'm actually um, had a science background through college and, and afterwards working in a lot of research and um, medical fields, getting into sales of scientific products. Um, but always, I guess, probably goes back to a little bit of my Greek heritage where food was always a huge part of pretty much everything we did as a family. Um, so I've always loved that and always kind of had a passion for learning about other cultures and cuisines and kind of how it relates to their traditions. And I guess that's ultimately what uh, led me after a, a big change at work that was unexpected to, um, I was living in Seattle at the time, move back to Boston and start a food tour where I now take people around um, some of the best neighborhoods in Boston and show them what the neighborhood has to offer from both a historical, cultural, and architectural perspective. And then, of course, uh, take them to some of the best local eateries and have them sample some foods along the way. So, Excellent. Thank you, <laughs> Alyssa. And uh, we were so fortunate to go on one of these food tours a couple of years ago. And we wrote all about it in our latest issue on Boston. You can find that on our members uh, section of our website. And uh, yeah, it was it was so memorable, and I can't wait to go back and try another one. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Sucheta, let's hear from you. Hi, everybody. My name is Sucheta. I am originally from India, and I've been writing about food and travel for about 15 years. So I started doing restaurant reviews in Atlanta, and then expanding my research of ethnic foods by traveling to these destinations and finding out how people really eat at their home, where the ingredients coming from and what's the cultural story behind the foods that we eat. So I started a blog in 2011, which is called Go Eat Give. And the blog uh, converted into a nonprofit organization down the street which uh, encourages people to learn about different cultures through food travel and community service. So I take people on tours around the world where they experience the local food by going to people's homes, taking food tours. I also write about food and I also teach cooking classes uh, all around the country on different ethnic cuisines. So my house, if you come to my house, my pantry is like the wool market. You can find everything in here. Wow, yum. <laughs> wow, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> uh, let's see, Rosemary and Claire, how about you? Good morning. I'm Claire, <laughs> and, and I'm Rosemary. And um, 
we started Authentic Food Quest um, as a personal quest uh, about in 2015. And it's now evolved to be a resource platform that connects travelers to local food experiences. Um, so we come from a corporate background, the both of us, um, engineering, marketing on Claire's end, and advertising strategy on my end. And go ahead, I'm sorry. And I'm from France, so food has already been part of uh, my, you know, my family. And later on, wherever I travel, I would always uh, eat the local specialties and get to know a place through food. And with this, with this project that we started was really around introducing people to the local flavors of a destination. Uh, whenever we travel, we experience the world through food, but we realize in our own travels that not everyone does the same. And so with Authentic Food Quest, what we want to do is highlight the local dishes so that when people are traveling to those areas, they know what not to miss. So it's the markets to go to, the dishes to eat, the drinks and the local specialties, so everything around food. Um, so we started in South America. We have been to Southeast Asia and um, are preparing our next travels um, shortly, which, we'll, which, which we're still planning on where they will be. But right now, the platform, Authentic Food Quest, is a resource um, platform for travelers looking for authentic and local specialties. Excellent. How exciting. <laughs> uh, and Dylan. Um, and I think it's good evening from me, actually, because I'm actually speaking to all of you from uh, London, actually. Uh, so my name is Dylan, and uh, I started the Travelling Editor around seven years ago and uh, became a travel writer and photographer. Uh, so as, as far as my own live journey went, um, I, I sort of went from writing you know, primarily about travel to getting more and more immersed into food, um, and, and I actually was born and raised in Hong Kong, so food has already been such a, you know, it's, it's within the bloodline of, you know, I'd, I'd say, uh, of, of my own uh, lineage and uh, background. And uh, as, as I further went along, I decided that with my partner now, wife Sarah, we decided to start our own supper club um, at our own home. And uh, the entire idea of the supper club, which is called Eats Club, is that we would incorporate um, a lot of the different cooking techniques, ingredients, and uh, culinary, uh, the, the sort of culinary concepts from around the world, places we've been to, uh, and incorporate them into dishes, into something that we kind of describe as the sort of edible storytelling. Uh, and uh, eventually, <laughs> I suppose I, I've always had this curiosity about um, food, and definitely in particular with um, food anthropology and the way how food is being produced, grown, um, things like that, to the very origin of food, um, to, to a point that I actually, uh, with my wife now, actually decided to start our own urban farm. Uh, so we're actually, uh, have just moved into our new home, uh, that, that comes with a decent sized backyard, and uh, we we're actually still in the process of doing it, but we're, we're basically turning, you know, a big turf of grass into vegetable plots, um, growing things that are not just, um, sourced in the UK, but also uh, seeds that we've actually brought over from elsewhere, abroad, seeds that friends have sent over, seeds that we've collected from when we're traveling. So yeah, this is, this is where we are at the moment. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you all here and to have so many different perspectives on food. And um, I'm just I'm looking forward to getting into this conversation of finding some of the most authentic food and, and even creating that again once we return home and uh, share that experience with, with others as well. So my first question, <laughs> diving into food, what are some of the more memorable culinary experiences you've had and what made those particularly special? Uh, Alyssa, let's start with you. Okay, so I guess um, some of the best food experiences I've had have been really kind of more or less unplanned. And one, the first one that comes to mind easily was uh, while traveling a few years back, I was with my mother, my aunt and my uncle, and actually two of my younger cousins. And we were in Greece and we, I actually flew over and met up with them um, kind of mid trip. My uncle was on a sabbatical. So he was in Europe at the time for, for nine weeks, which was an Un unbelievable experience that they had. So I joined them for two. And uh, in that trip, we went to the island of Lesbos and we actually stayed in a home that was owned by um, a woman who had recently 
um, been widowed. So she was living there alone and basically rented out the upstairs um, of her home for people to stay in. So we were staying there, which was a really authentic experience in and of itself. And one of the nights she brought home all these fresh little fish from the market and just invited us down kind of onto her patio downstairs where she put them on the grill, just the whole fish grilled them up and we just all kind of sat around casually um, on the patio around and she sort of explains where the fish had come from and, and there was a bit of a language barrier there so we're kind of struggling to piece together certain portions of the story but at the end of the day food really does become kind of a universal language that everyone can understand and once everyone's mouths are full of the food it doesn't matter so much anyway so I think it's just kind of those moments where you come together with people. Um, for me, it's sort of been more accidental than planned, like that experience. And you just get to really sit in someone's home or and you know enjoy the food that they would eat, just how she would eat it. It wasn't any fancy preparation or presentation that she did. And it's just, I think for my cousins, my aunt and uncle and my mom, it's, it's something that we all remember and, and continue to talk about. So uh, sometimes it's hard to plan when you're traveling to, to find those experiences, but I think if you're sort of putting yourself in the right position you know where you stay when you travel for example if you're sort of staying with a local then it's more likely that something like that is is going to happen so um, I think that's that's my most favorite one <laughs> beautiful I, I agree absolutely I, I think a lot of us probably agree <laughs> with that statement is uh, it's putting yourself in a, in a different kind of position to be able to have that experience to begin with mm -hmm. uh, wonderful uh, see, Sujata? Sure. So I have so many memorable experiences regarding food. It's really hard to pick one. But I'm going to pick Italy because it is one of those countries. Everybody loves Italian food. They travel to Italy in search for great food. My first visit to Italy, I was so disappointed. I went to all the touristy spots in Rome, Florence, Pisa, Venice. And everything I ate was like, this is mediocre. I did not expect this kind of food from everything I've heard about in Italy. And then I've been back five, six times. And every time I've been back, I have done totally off the touristy experiences. I've stayed in home, home visits, small towns, far, agro-tourism farms. But one of the most memorable experiences I've had, and, and of course the food has been phenomenal since I started doing all of that. Um, I found this group of nine men in a small vi village in Tuscany. It's called Mar Marcatello de Sur. And they, have, they run an organization called Academia de Padlot. So it's the academy of the thing that they you use like a paddle like a pizza paddle and these nine men they get together once a month and they cook dinner all of them get together and they eat and drink and it's just for them it's not open to the public it's like a social circle but you know how many times you get hear about men getting together and cooking <laughs> and not just sitting around drinking and playing games so uh, this occasion, they happened to invite a few people because I knew, came to know them through a friend, and they invited me and a couple of other travelers, journalists, and they cooked a dinner for us in this house. And these guys are drinking and making huge bowls of pasta, and everything is, of course, locally sourced. They brought their meat from the butcher, and this is a very tiny village. Like most people don't know where it is, even in Italy. And we sat around the fire, we drank and talked, and somebody started singing and eating. So that's, I think, really immersing in that cultural experience, not just the food, but then having the men cook for me. That was amazing, too. Absolutely. Wow. <laughs> that uh, sounds like a, a once-in-a-lifetime kind of opportunity, too, to have so many, so many men cooking so much amazing food and, uh, and sharing in that experience. That's great. <laughs> Uh, Rosemary and Claire, how about you guys? Well, you know, as, as well, uh, like some of the other speakers have mentioned, it's hard really picking one, one situation to really highlight and talk about because food does really bring us all together. Um, there is one story, though, that um, is really dear to us, and this is in Chile. And we had spent, we were in Chile, and we were discovering the local dishes in the country. 
and we were and locals and um, locals we met, chefs that we met, all said, "You got to go to the north of Chile. You got to go to the Atacama Desert and explore the food there." And so we were, you know, a, a lot of the times we were like, "What grows in the desert? What are the local and authentic foods in the desert?" So that was really an interesting question that we had personally. So fast forward, we make our way over to San Pedro de Atacama. And, um, you know, which I should mention, by the way, is the driest desert in the world. And it's a small, sleepy little town, very quiet, um, adobe-like buildings, one street. And on the main street, I mean, there are a few streets, but on the main street is where there are a lot of restaurants. And all the restaurants are very catering, catering towards tourists. So the kinds of places that are, you know, inviting you in, people standing out, telling you, come in, walk in, you know, really the kind of place you don't want to go to and certainly not the place that you'll find the local specialties. And so one time we were walking up and down the street, um, Claire's birthday was coming up and we were looking for a really special and unique place to eat. And so I remember we just walked off, we walked off the street, we you know, dumped the guidebooks that we had, the maps that we had, and we just said, let's go walk around and you know, see what we discover. And so as we were walking, we passed this building um, you know, very nondescript, but it had a name, and you know, the name is Baltinachi. It was not open. We couldn't tell the hours. They were not listed on the door. But we look, you know, looking at it from the outside, it was a restaurant, and so so that piqued our curiosity off the beaten path. And so we went back to the hostel where we were staying, and our host um, told us that it is indeed a restaurant. They do serve local specialties. And she helped make reservations for us because it's the kind of place where they open when they open. You know, the hours again are not published, so you never quite know. So fortunately, uh, we were able to get reservations the day of Claire's birthday. And when we went in there, uh, what really made the experience amazing is the chef um, is a Mapuche Indian, and Mapuches are the original people of China. Of excuse me, of Chile. And what we were looking for was that authentic experience. Um, the chef is married to a gentleman from San Pedro de Atacama, so he is also able to bring in the local aspects and the local um, ingredients from the area. So we ended up having the most amazing cuisine, a fusion of Mapuche ingredients, um, ingredients from San Pedro de Atacama. I mean, we started off with, you know, pisco sour, which is one of the beverages, very popular beverages um, in South America, particularly in Chile and um, Peru. And it's a, it's a Pisco brandy. But what they do in San Pedro de Atacama and specifically at this restaurant is add a local herb called Rica Rica. And that herb um, is actually good for the digestive system. So they were blending, you know, dishes from the country plus ingredients um, you know, from San Pedro de Atacama cooked in a very ingenious flair um, that was incredible, incredible. Um, and, and it's the type of restaurant where you only have one menu. So it's not the menu where you find everything from pizza to pasta to maybe one or two local dishes. They really cater to the type of cuisine they make one menu, two choices, and that's it. So the opportunity mm -hmm. to have had that experience, to talk to the chef after our meal, um, to learn more about the Mapuche Indians and the contributions um, in Chile and in the food specifically, um, and just getting off the beaten path really made that uh, one, just one story that was absolutely incredible. Um, so really, you know, you got to get off the path, um, as Suchetta said, and, you know, go, go far, you know, dump everything and, you know, be spontaneous and see what awaits you. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you for those amazing suggestions and the stories. Uh, we're definitely going to get into the suggestions in just a minute, uh, but I do want to hear from Dylan about his uh, authentic foodie experiences as well. I feel ridiculously dwarf now because these are all absolutely fantastic examples you guys have all given um i mean my, my take of it is that for, for me at least um food is very sensory uh so a lot of times when people associate food uh with just taste alone um it's it's so much more than that especially from you know the, the perspective of, of a chef with somebody who uh cooks as well uh that it's very much about the sight it's very much about the smell it's very much about what you can hear what you can feel on your fingertips and uh, quite often, the most memorable food experiences tend to be the ones that inflict the most 
um, I'd say stimulus, I'd say, when it comes down to your surroundings and everything. They tend to be the ones that you make the most effort of, the ones that you have walked the most to, uh, the ones that make you feel the most pain, uh, for instance, you know, the, the, the hottest thing that you've ever put in your throat, but you just can't resist just, you know, taking another gulp of that noodle, spicy noodle soup, because it's so damn good in a meal, in, you know, as a breakfast item. Um, but then sometimes beyond all of that, um, you know, with, with memorability, it often fluctuates and often responds to your surrounding. I mean, if I smell, um, you know, a waft of smoke from outside, that will probably um, evoke the memory of me being in certain smoke houses and actually get to see um, all these wonderful meats and fishes being turned into smoke fish and smoke meat. Um, if I hear the sound of sizzling, that's probably that amazing barbecue I had um, or you know just grilling something by the sea um, that's fresh out of it um, but sometimes some of the most memorable experiences I've had isn't to do with how good something tastes but how scarce food is actually uh, that one particular example I would say is a memorable experience is when I was in uh, when I was spending time in some of the, uh, the islands in Vanuatu in the South Pacific um, Islands where on um, on one of the islands, I befriended a local called uh, Flavian. He was just he had a sign down by the village saying that he's selling woodcraft. And he, I just you know got curious and poked around, had a look, went up and uh, looked around his wares. Didn't really wasn't really interested in buying anything. Just wanted to look. And we got chatting. And he's got a friend who's Australian, and he's processing some visa papers. And you know he asked me if you know with my better English per se would actually help him have a look at it. So we did that for an afternoon, chatted, I got to know his family, and then unexpectedly, um, whilst I was staying in a different guest house and having all my meals catered for, um, I just got an invitation from Flavian to have dinner at his place. And what he and his wife cooked up was this earthen dish of um, palm leaves wrapping um, mashed up yam and pieces of beef. Uh, some root vegetables and things like that, but you know, just to acknowledge the fact that all of those things are scarce. They're barely, you know, they're probably about ten to fifteen bovine presents on the entire island alone. Uh, and chances are, they actually went in and made the effort to get some of that when, you know, basically I subsisted for two days on the island on rice and tin tuna, um, and they actually went all that effort making that for me. I think in the end. You know, I can't really tell you so much about how it tasted because I would say in that particular instance, the taste itself was the weakest sensory perception I had. I remember the smell of the kerosene lamp that was in, in the back. I remember the flicker seeing it. I remember the laughter I had, you know, chatting with Flavian, just, you know, be spending time with his family. So by the end of the day, it's not just about what you taste, but it's very much about the environment, the circumstances, sheer serendipity of you being in a situation where you certainly wouldn't expect to be there. You're probably expecting yourself to be elsewhere or eating something that you expect to taste. Um, but um, it just ended up being something else. Wow. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing such amazing stories. And, and I want to kind of get into how viewers can have similar experiences. I mean, this isn't something unique and special that happens uh, just to specific people. If you um, follow certain ways of traveling, you can have something uh, similar. <laughs> so my next question gets into how do each of you try to find authentic experiences? And um, what are some specific things that you look for, like in restaurants, to know that you're going to have an authentic uh, dish? <laughs> um, let's see, Alyssa, let's start again with you. Hmm. So traveling, I guess, I, I do like to start with food tours. I think that um, it's, it's a really good way to kind of get the lay of the land. And usually the ones that I've been on have really taken me off the beaten path and into some neighborhoods and things that are probably less traveled or and or if it's, you know, not necessarily 
way off the beaten track. You definitely learn from the guide who is typically a local person um, where to eat, some recommendations that they have. And I just kind of make it a point to talk to people a lot and ask people, you know, where where they like to eat and where something that, you know, we may not have found in this general area, even if it requires a little bit of extra travel to kind of get to and, and you know, the, why we should go to that specific place. And that, that seems to work out really well. People always have their favorites and, you know, places that they've been going to or that has a special meaning or story for them. And I think um, for me, it's just worked best once you're kind of on the ground to kind of make a point to have those conversations with with people locally. And, and um, I've always ended up having some really fun, interesting adventures and, and food experiences as a result of that. So that's, that's what I would say to that. <laughs> Wonderful. Excellent. All right. So good, good advice. Uh, let's see, Suchetta. So I agree with Alyssa. That's my favorite thing to do is a food tour the first day in every country I go to. I also seek out to go to people's homes for meals. And generally when I'm traveling to a new destination, I'll go on Facebook. I'll say I'm going to, I'm actually leaving for Tokyo tomorrow. Um, who do I know who lives there or maybe a friend a friend can introduce me and have a second degree contact uh, I may post it on Twitter on LinkedIn if I don't find anything there I'll look in couch surfing uh, for not necessarily staying with people but just to meet up with someone and I would send them requests saying let's eat at your neighborhood restaurant or maybe I can come to your house and we can cook something together and I'll be happy to contribute towards the cost of the food. Most of the time they invite me for free. So that's really nice. I get a meal out of it. I get to understand how people live, see their kitchens, and then eat something that is very authentic, local. And I see the flavors of food. You know, you may have the same dish found in every restaurant, but the flavor of how it's cooked at home is very different. So I want to understand that, how people eat at home versus what they eat at restaurants. How would they typically eat a weeknight meal? What would the thing, ingredients that they would use? So that's what I would seek out for is just going to somebody's homes for dinner. And now there are so many other websites too where you can book a home hosted meal. You pay 20 bucks and then you become a part of a small group and go there. I haven't used any of those websites because uh, I just find friends of friends and through that network I've been able to do that. But if I don't have a place, then I will definitely look for that as well. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that. Those are some really great tips. <laughs> uh, let's see, Rosemary and Claire, do you have? Yeah, I think uh, Suchita really you know, gave us here some great tips. And I think uh, we share some of those. Uh, one of the things we do when we travel is we try to stay with locals. And we use a lot of Airbnb and we share a bedroom uh, with, within a house or an apartment with someone. And that's a way to uh, be on, uh, you know, eating at their home is also a way to get to know what their favorite place is to go eat out. Um, so really talking with locals is a way to learn where to go to get really the, the local food and specialties. And one other way we do that is we also visit uh, local farmers markets. And talking to vendors and being curious about the food and what they sell and then asking them what are their local spots, where they go to eat themselves. And sometimes we got some really great recommendations. I remember in Argentina, in the northern Argentina, we got one of the best empanada uh, spots, local spots, that was really of a beaten path. So, so that's also one advice is going to farmer's market and try to mingle with vendors, even if there's you know, always a communication barriers. But as long as you have uh, open mind and curiosity, that can open also uh, some ideas. Um, another thing we also use is uh, maybe local resources. So what we found out is that it exists also like the Yelp, uh, like in Argentina, is called Guia Oleo. And there, even if you don't understand the language, you can always translate it in Google. 
and get to know what are the favorite places of the locals. Uh, in Vietnam, it was called, I think, foodie.vn. And same thing, we don't know a word of uh, Vietnamese, at least Spanish, <laughs> we can <laughs> get along. But as far as Vietnamese there, we were also able to get some references from those local uh, sources. Fantastic, wonderful. I, I love the idea of going to local supermarkets, local markets, um, and just seeing what's there uh, that, that people there enjoy. Uh, you mentioned in your previous interview that, uh, you know, sometimes you see like rows and rows of dulce de leche <laughs> um, mm -hmm. in Argentina. And, uh, and so it's always fun to get that kind of a perspective from a place. And uh, that's a really great tip. Uh, Dylan. Okay, I think I might throw a bone into the mix, actually, because um, I, I was just actually contemplating about the uh, definition of authenticity uh, when it comes down to local food. And quite often with authentic food, you know, there are times when there are the sort of things that you would, um, you know, the, the authentic dishes, the food that's cooked the authentic way, you know, that's the sort of, that's the general mindset when it comes down to regarding the word authentic or seeking authenticity in food. Um, but um, as the as the great uh, Robert Reed, uh, a very re relatively predominant uh, travel writer, has once said, uh, he actually mentioned that the best way to find food um, is not to think like a traveller, but think like a travel writer. Uh, because what a travel writer does is that he would go and do research and then do research again and then do research again uh, before they would make any culinary decisions at all. And um, I'm, I'm only really quoting this because one, I actually read that particular quote in that particular blog post when I was in Vietnam. And two, using Vietnam as an example in this case, um, what is considered as authentic food in Vietnam is uh, sometimes dog meat. Now, there are actually designated dog, dog restaurants uh, in Vietnam. And, you know, by all means, that would be considered authentic. And, you know, sure enough, a lot of travelers would go into Vietnam and say, hey, look, dog meat, that's authentic. The locals eat it. Let's do it. Uh, but from a responsibility perspective, what people don't see and certainly do not know unless you've done the extensive research about it, and I'm only really citing this as an example because I'm sure there are plenty of other stories, cases, um, you know, malpractices out there. Um, there is actually a very lucrative trade in Vietnam for dog snatching. Now, people would actually go to homes and steal people's dogs to take them to the dog market. Uh, and what we, by being party to the whole dog eating trade, what we actually do not know is that we've actually created a demand that's actually feeding that immorality basically so um, you know there are lots of small things that happen around the world and I certainly don't want to throw in a lot of negativity into this you know otherwise very um, positive productive and very resourceful um, you know conversation right now but there are obviously pitfalls when it comes down to culinary travel there are the, the wonderful things that we can experience we can taste uh, but there are also the sort of things that where we're yanking much more intricate threads out there uh, that may or may not be contributing to, you know, a lot of suffering. So um, basically, do your research well. And I'm not going to say a particular resource is good or a particular website is good. Scour the internet. Just absolutely scour it until you find the information that's going to satisfy you um, before you can make a, a learned and ethical decision about pursuing ethical food. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, Dylan. And that is something um, is as being part of a, you know, being a responsible traveler is doing doing that research and seeing uh, sometimes you go to a place and you think that that is something local and you think that that's something authentic because that's what you've heard. But then you do a little bit more digging and you find out that, no, that's really just what tourists want to do because it started a while back and, and that's really no longer the case. Or, you know, yeah, sometimes it's become such a problem that uh, it's causing more more instability and more problems in other areas. And so, uh, yeah, definitely doing that research is important. <laughs> Thank you for talking about that. Uh, so kind of getting into some of the details, I'm interested to hear everyone's perspective on both street food 
and uh, maybe like food trucks. You know, food trucks have become very popular in the United States. Um, but uh, just finding food that is not necessarily in a restaurant. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And start with Alyssa. So <clears throat> that is one food trucks. I don't have a whole lot of experience with that. I mean, they, they are kind of everywhere, so I've definitely explored them a little bit, um, just more out of convenience in Boston, kind of when they're in the area that I'm walking to or from another place and I happen to be hungry or it's a meal time and check them out because I've heard of them, but it's not necessarily something, I guess, that I've really sought out on, on purpose. Um, I have had some great experiences with them. There are some really great ones. Probably the most experience I've had is in Boston. Um, there's a, a few that have now opened into brick and mortar shops. So they've sort of started in a food truck, which has been a really interesting, to me, way to sort of test out your product before committing to everything that goes along with having a physical location. And the one that comes to mind there is uh, Roxy's Grilled Cheese, for example. So a lot of people have heard of that. They participated in the great food truck race or the show that was was on television and gained some instant popularity from that. And in fact, um, their first brick and mortar is in a neighborhood called Alston, which is between uh, Boston University and Boston College. It's a great, great uh, student neighborhood that's definitely less traveled by tourists, kind of a younger vibe over there, but lots of delicious food uh, coming into that area. And we, we just launched a tour over there this season. So Roxy's Grilled Cheese and their whole story kind of from food truck to brick and mortar to more food trucks um, has become a great part of our story over there. So I think it can definitely be um, a great experience. There are, you know, food truck tours that I know about. Um, people tend to uh, and manage to figure out. In Boston, they move around all over the place. So you essentially have to follow an app or follow their social media feeds to figure out where any given truck is going to be on any given day. So I kind of like that aspect of it. Um, and also in the south end of Boston, where my first tour and the one we've been doing um, since 2011 is on Sundays, they actually have the SOWA, the South of Washington Street open market in that neighborhood. And they have actually set up more or less kind of a um, a food truck garden. So on Sundays, a lot of the food trucks in Boston all gather at the SOA open market. So it's a great chance to kind of see a lot of them all at once. My problem with uh, that is that I always want to try something from all of them. And usually it's not a small enough portion that you can get from one to sort of continue on to one or the other. So having to make that decision to sort of have one thing, a full size portion from one is, is a little bit frustrating to me. <laughs> I almost wish that they had kind of little sampler portions so that you could sort of try a little bit more from each one of them. Um, so I, I, I do love the idea and I think it's a really, it, it just brings a really fun uh, vibe to a lot of city events. They tend to gather for that. And a totally separate experience I had um, was in Mexico when I went, um, there were a lot of street taco trucks and trying chorizo tacos from a street truck for the first time was an amazing experience that we repeated multiple times on that trip. So I think in the right context, in the right location, it's definitely um, a great whole other kind of arm of the food scene, so. Wow, thank you, thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> um, I think of Portland. Uh, you know, Portland has uh, whole courtyards of, of food trucks and same thing, like you wanna try little bits of every different truck, but then yeah, they give you these giant things and it's like, oh, well, I guess next time I'll try the other truck. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, Sujenta, how about your experiences with street food? So as a food writer, I am super excited about how street food has been accepted mainstream. Um, especially in the restaurant scene. Now every restaurant seems to be trending to, we have authentic Indian street food or we have Asian street food and it becomes instantly popular. People want to go try it. Before there was sort of a taboo around street food. It's unhygienic. It is something that you only eat if you're a local and you're able to digest <laughs> the local water. Uh, but I think it's that perception is changing and people are more um, into trying it. And a lot of food tours have actually started around street food tours, whereas before it was only going a restaurant hopping or tasting. But now 
I think the two recent ones that I've done, and they are by all means one of my favorite, I'd say three. Uh, one was a recently I did in Bangkok, the food street food capital of the world. Um, amazing, cheap, and clean. You know, you can be walking down the street, try 10 different things. Like you said, you know, this is a place where you don't have to restrict yourself to one food truck because the portions are reasonable. Um, they're not too much. And you're paying maybe a dollar for one dish, and then you can go walk for another mile and then go try something different. And you will see that the locals are eating it during their work days. They're picking up food after work, uh, curries that are packed in little individual plastic bags, uh, rice and satay, and they're grilling chicken right in front of you. So it's, it's hygienic. I don't think anybody, um, most people feel like they don't fall sick in, in Thailand. In India, it's a different matter. I don't recommend eating the street food from the street. But India has done something different. Um, they have these very casual cafe style restaurants where you can also go and get the street food. Um, it is still cheap. It's very basic, but it's clean. So the, instead of, you know, they, they monitor the water and the hygiene conditions. So you are able to get the same kind of experience. And when I'm on tour there, when I take my group, I always have a day where they can eat all the street food they want. Because it's such a sensual experience when you're walking down the street, you know, we're going to the attractions and they're seeing uh, them making these uh, little donuts or they're frying something. And every time they're like, can I try it? Can I try it? I'm like, no, you have to wait till we go to this one place. And then um, is um, Naples uh, in Southern Italy was my all time favorite. And if you give me a flight ticket right now, I'll be there in the next eight hours and eat my way out there. <laughs> Pizza is $3. You can eat on the street and have some um, nice fried breads and pastries. And it's, it's just an amazing experience for me to just walk down these 400-year-old streets and try a bite of this, a bite of that, and understand the culture and the scenery behind it. But then these are local vendors making recipes that have been in their families for so many decades and they're using all local ingredients. So you know you're supporting a local vendor. Uh, you're trying something authentic, but then you're not spending a lot of money. You know, if you were to go have a dinner at a formal restaurant, maybe you spend $30. And in $30, you can eat like five days worth of food just walking around the streets in Naples. So that, that's one of my favorites. And then Istanbul. <laughs> Lovely. Oh, man, thank you for all of that. that I can was... go on and on, as you know. I, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I could, I could talk with you guys all day long about this. We do have about 10 minutes left. Um, so I do want to hear from Authentic Food Quest and Dylan about street food. And then I have another question after that. So. Well, you know, street food is really um, a way to really get to know the culture through the food. So I think for us, it's one of the best way to really taste the uh, local culture. And what's been interesting is to see how on the Western side, people have revived street food and how now it's really so popular. And as for travel, we've been able to witness the different type of street food and where it's very popular and it's always been, you know, preeminent, like in Southeast Asia, if you don't eat in the street, you don't really get a taste of the local food. Uh, while when we were in South America, for example, in Argentina, street food is not really popular. I mean, it's getting more trendy now. But the reason is Argentinian, they love to take time to eat, sit down, relax, talk with their friends. So the culture of street food and grabbing something from a truck and just eating there is not really for them, although they have few spots. Uh, you know, they have like the choy pan, which is a sandwich with their traditional sausages that you can get, and that, that's a real uh, Argentinian street food. But it's less of a uh, popular athlete to eat Argentinian food. 
Um, so for us, it's been really discovering the culture for the street food is kind of a wonderful way to get to know a place. Wow, excellent, excellent. <laughs> wow, this is also helpful. <laughs> uh, Oh, I think you mute, muted yourself before you finished that sentence, actually. Oh, well. Um, so let's just say that restaurants are way too much to lose, right? So operating a restaurant from an industry perspective, you have to think about bills, you have to think about upkeep, you have to think about fancy cutlery, fancy crockery. I mean, how many plates are you going to break? How many glasses are you going to break? Just running a restaurant itself is not easy. Um, the amount of expenses they're going to put into it, the amount, the pressure that's on you to entice the next person to come through your door, uh, that's hard. And in a lot of the, 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 you know, the old school restaurateur trade, I'd say, is that the best way to loop people in and hook them in and get them to sit down and spend a ton of money um, on, on something is just to offer them as many options as you can give them. Variety. People love variety. People love a 10-page menu. People want to have a look at every single one of them and imagine themselves eating every single one of them. And that's how you get them. As it's proven, it doesn't really work like that. People don't actually want to. People's palates are becoming more refined nowadays. People have had more culinary experiences from more places, and they have a certain expectation of how things should taste like. Um, the old age of old school restauranteuring of offering them 100 million options on the menu, it doesn't work. It's not a viable option anymore. People want to specialize. People want to say they want to have that one thing that that one person does, that does really well, that keeps on doing day in, day out until they've completely refined it and mastered it. Uh, maybe add more things on top of it. It could be a blank canvas. It could just be a piece of bread um, with some toppings on it, but you know, as long as that person is doing that, it's that person is going. That person has the aspiration towards mastery, not keeping the restaurant afloat. And I think that's exactly what street food and food carts are doing. Um, it's very hard to distinguish two because nowadays it's very much bundled up as one. Um, food trucks, food trucks. I know street food, conventional sense in itself is still also a very ambiguous term. Um, you can't really associate the street food that you've got in India or Thailand with the ones in, say, Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, even though that the format's very similar, the level of hygiene is worlds apart, worlds apart. Um, and you would almost say that the ones that you've got in uh, Malaysia, the hawkers markets in Malaysia and Singapore, they're probably more similar to actually uh, with the food trucks that we have in the Western world. Um, uh, but they share the same philosophy, they share the same methodology. It's all about just day in, day out, making very limited things, specializing in something that is going to taste ridiculously nice because they've had years, decades uh, just refining it. Um, it's, it's something I definitely picked up uh, that could be as simple as uh, when I was in Puglia in South uh, Italy, in Southern Italy, when I was spending quite a lot of time there doing work with the tourist board. Uh, when one evening when we got to Bari, the capital of the region, when we just saw this, um, this, this nonna, this grandmother, um, opening up her shop that is downstairs where she lives. It's just one of those wooden shutter windows that she opened up. And inside, a gigantic wok of hot oil. And all she does is sell deep fried polenta cakes. Never thought that polenta could taste that nice ever, ever in my life. I mean, I would not have picked it up in a restaurant. Chances are I probably wouldn't even have picked it up from the food truck and I just got it from that because that person has specialized in it. And I think with the amount of risk factor um, when it comes down to running a street food enterprise, it allows people to do that. It allows people to be creative and to be um, refining and to be um, excellent at the very few things they do. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, again, so, so many wonderful, helpful things that I'm learning about. <laughs> Um, we do have two minutes left. Um, I'm sorry, we do have to wrap things up, but I do want to hear from each of you um, some specific tips on um, what to look for to find that authentic food. I know, Rosemary, you mentioned earlier, uh, if you have you see a restaurant where someone's waving you in, you're like, come in, come in, come in and eat. That's usually a sign that it's more of a touristy place and not necessarily a local place. And so what kinds of suggestions do you all have uh, very quickly? about um, finding some of those best uh, experiences. Uh, Alyssa. 
So I guess on this one, I have to go with the obvious answer, which is food tours. <laughs> so I really think that, and especially when taken at the beginning of a trip is the best way to do it. Because usually, um, you know, of all the ones that I've been on, you do get a local person or someone who is very familiar with the place that you're visiting and is eager and excited about food, which is why they are a food tour guide to begin with. So they are a great, just natural resource for that type of information. I know that um, for my tour right Right now, my two tour guides actually have their master's in gastronomy from Boston University, so they could not be any more excited about food and kind of food put into the context of uh, the local culture. So on my tour specifically, we really focus on um, putting food into exactly that context because I think it's best enjoyed when you're also familiar and understanding the specific surroundings that you're in while you're eating that food. So in a neighborhood, the types of restaurants that exist there are usually very indicative of the types of of people that live there and you know what where they live what they like to eat what also they like to do for recreation and fun so all of that you can kind of see in the neighborhood if it, if the story is told correctly which is exactly what we try to do and also leave our guests with a whole list of um, other restaurants in the neighborhood that we may not visit as an actual part of the tour but places that are our favorites and that we may point out along the route so it just is a great way to sort of get that that overview of the area that you're in and then you can kind of tweak it through the rest of your trip as as you see fit. <laughs> Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Sucheta? Uh, I think you're muted, Sucheta. Try that again. Sorry. So I would uh, add to what Alyssa said and then I would also tell people not to make a common mistake where they actually go to the concierge of the hotel and ask, where should I go eat? What are the nice restaurants nearby? And I would totally avoid that because most of the time they're gonna send you to places that are well known by tourists. They're gonna look at you as a foreigner and think of you to send of you some um, nice chic place or something that's safe. And they feel like maybe you wanna eat something from back home. And I totally avoid that. Instead, I would go to some residential neighborhoods, walk around there and see where people are gathered, you know, people who live around there, like Claire's, um, you also mentioned earlier. And where, what are the places that are crowded with locals? And I would just walk in there and eat there. Um, also, like I mentioned earlier, I try to meet up with local people and have them take me to a restaurant that they normally go to. Um, have them even order for you. So instead of, you know, turning the pages and looking for things that you know names of and you're familiar with, just tell them, you know, I, I like seafood. Can you order me some dish that you think I would like, which also has local flavors, and allow them to take charge and introduce you to the local cuisine. Excellent. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, Rosemary and Claire, any last tips? <laughs> I think the one thing that we would add to that, because um, we agree with everything that's been said so far, is look for a place with a short menu. Um, so a place that does not have a lot of options. They specialize, um, as Dylan said earlier, in one or two, one or two, three things, and you'll be and you'll be set. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yes, short menus, short menus, absolutely. Specialties, yeah, that Dylan was talking about. That's great. Uh, Dylan, any last tips? Couple. Uh, firstly. Uh, you can find food by not finding it. Uh, don't be afraid to go back to the same restaurant that you've been to that is really good. Chances are you probably never got around to save the entire menu, so why not uh, go back and check out the rest of it? I think quite often when we travel, we feel that urge to go and check, um, you know, take off as many places as possible to actually try as many new places as possible. Uh, but quite often, when you actually have locked into that one restaurant, that one meal that was really good, chances are you're going to have another one that's going to be just as good, if not better, probably from a different place in the same menu. So go back to that place if you are really short of ideas. Um, one of the things that was being said about the uh, the concierge, I uh, just want to add, sometimes the concierge actually gets uh, commission rates from restaurants to promote them. So uh, beware of that. Uh, the next tip that I've got, uh, it's a growing trend. It's probably not as, conspicu uh, not as uh, conspicuous and uh, ubiquitous in a moment, but it's probably going to in the next 10 years. If you see a place that's got food growing around it, definitely check it out. 
you see a little vegetable patch that's you know poking out of the rooftop of a restaurant yeah definitely investigate um those would be a good sign if people know a thing or two about growing food and surely they know a thing or two about making them wonderful oh my goodness so many so many good tips i just can't wait to travel again <laughs> to test all these out um, thank you all so much for being here today. It was such a pleasure to hear from you and hear your stories and have, hear your advice. Um, and I hope that we can do this again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Blair. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, <laughs>